Kat and Kachansky staggered into the chamber, carrying two large oxygen tanks, and clanged them noisily onto the floor under the hatchway. We've got enough oxygen for a month, and the cats even sniffed out some more battery backup for Rimmer. Crichton looked up from the microscope. We've found some more ident-coded vials, and their contents have turned out to be quite extraordinary. One of the sidebars of the DNA research was the discovery that all viruses fall into two categories, negative and positive. The negative we are very much aware of. The cat craned over his shoulder. What, like smallpox, flu, measles, rabies, that kind of stuff? Crichton nodded. But they also discovered that there were positive viruses, viral infections that actually improve the human condition. Such as? Well, at the very basic level, they predicted a kind of reverse flu, a strain of virus that promotes a feeling of unaccountable well-being and euphoria and can last for years. According to these notes, 20th century DJs were constant sufferers. The cat inspected the tray of vials. So what's in the tubes? Isolated strains of positive viruses that cause retro infections. He picked a blue vial and held it to the light. Inspiration. They cooed appreciatively. He held up another. Sexual magnetism. The cat's eyebrows crash-landed into the bridge of his nose. Sexual magnetism is a virus? Get me to a hospital! I'm a terminal case! Crichton held up a third vial. But perhaps this is the most intriguing of all. This vial contains the positive virus they named Felicitas Populi, more commonly known as Luck. Luck is a virus? asked Kachansky. Crichton poured a minute amount of the liquid into a neck blast syringe. Wanna try some? Kachansky said. Is it safe? Perfectly. Kachansky pulled her collar aside and the syringe hissed into her neck. She rotated her head and straightened. So what now? Crichton handed her a pack of cards. Shuffle these cards and then pick out the four aces. She fanned them out, face down. Her hand moved along the line and flicked over a card. The Ace of Hearts. The odds of you picking out that card correctly are thirteen to one. Kachansky's hand went down the line again and picked out a second card. Ace of Diamonds. Two hundred and twenty-one to one. Kachansky turned over a third card. It was a club. The Ace. Five thousand five hundred and twenty-five to one. The fourth card. Ace again. The odds on you picking out four aces from a pack of unmarked cards are 270,725 to one. Have you any conception of what this means? He said quietly. Kachansky nodded. It means we're playing poker, that's what it means. Okay, twenty dollar pounds a stake, jukes are wild. Rimmer chipped in. I don't think that's exactly what Crichton had in mind, actually. Gin Rummy? I mean, Mom that if you've contracted the luck virus, it may be possible to detect the terraforming viruses out of the hundreds of thousands of samples that are strewn around the chamber. Kachansky nodded. OK, but then we play poker. She strolled across the lab, studying the floor, then stooped, thrust her hand into a mountain of tiny vials, and emerged with one. That one? I think so. Has it got a number? She rotated the vial and read off the viral ident code. Z C S B F D six O P I W fifty three. Rimmer smiled. That's the first virus. That's it. You've done it. Kachansky waded into another mound of vials and pulled out three more. Okay, I'll put my money at the second virus we need is this one. Here we go. K D N I U J nine eight S S C. Crichton gasped in dismay. It's not C, it's J. Kajansky grinned. Just jossing. J, J it is. What about the other two? Why did you choose them? I'm pretty sure this one is another vial of the luck virus. Crichton examined the serial number and nodded. And this one, Kajansky held it up to the light, is going to help me sometime, but I don't know how. She read out the serial number. Ninety seconds later, the computer flashed. Trace complete. 
and a description of the vial punched up onto the screen. Name, Brassica 2. Function, creates fast-growing broccoli. Kachansky shrugged. Don't ask me. Two hours later, they released the virus into the molten lava and watched anxiously for signs of cell corruption in the magma. Thirty minutes into the vigil, they received a positive analysis from the Mayflower's mainframe. The report anticipated mulch within five days and predicted it would be possible to drive through the mixture of thinning lava within 36 hours. Rimmer glanced at his watch. We haven't got much time to complete the salvage operation. I suggest we get cracking. Six hours later, Kachansky's body hit the springs of her bunk. She was asleep in seconds. Noiselessly, Crichton slipped on his diving suit and set the airlock for remote. Within minutes, he was striding back across the ocean bed in the direction of the Mayflower. He passed under a lead archway and stepped into a large, horseshoe-shaped crypt. He knew how to operate the DNA modifier now. The operation was really quite simple. He punched in the pattern of the new gene formation and the glass cylinder whooshed down from the ceiling. The modification began and the cylinder whited out. When it rose back into the roof and the smoke had cleared, Crichton was no longer there. Instead, there was a man. A naked man. A homo sapiens. What did you say your name was? Magruder, sir. Magruder? Your mother must have been Yvonne Magruder. A smile neoned across Magruder's face. Ever since I was a small child, she's regaled me with tales of his outstanding feats. She said I'd probably never meet him because his ship was lost in deep space, sir. When the ship's black box touched down in the Pacific, and I just knew he was still around, I also knew I had to find him, and I've kind of built my career around that search, sir. Was he really as truly astonishing as my mother made out? Well, said Lister, uncertain how to answer. Um, oh, obviously, uh, you know. Uh... Magruder looked at him expectantly. Was he really the greatest soldier who ever lived, sir? Better than Patton, sir. Better than anyone. All those tales of sacrifice and valor. Sometimes I have to confess, I wondered if my mother wasn't exaggerating just a little. What was he really like? Lister paced around the cave, his back to Magruder. Then he turned, his face sheathed in seriousness. What was he like? Yes, sir. He was... He was a truly great man. I knew it! A fine soldier, good friend, and a... and a... a hell of a great man. Magruder sparkled. Is it true, sir, that story about how he saved six officers when they were trapped inside the hold, and he... It's true, Lister interrupted. It's all true. Magruder's eyes lit up like two star clusters. And what about the time? That's true. Everything's true. It's just a crying damn shame you'll never get a chance to meet him. The last I heard, he was a hologram. What became of him? We, we got split up. He's with my girlfriend and a mechanoid, and, and this guy who evolved from cats. They could be in one of a gazillion realities. A sad smile pinched at Lister's mouth. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity, and a party of volunteers entered the cave. Nawaki, sire! The rage is coming! Magruder nodded. Split into three groups as always. Divide the men. The gelf turned quickly and left. The rage? Is, is that what destroys the land? Why do you call it the rage? The rage of innocence. All those internees imprisoned unfairly were forced to sacrifice their lives to help create the Gestalt. All those entities railing against the injustice of their punishment, furious at the inequity and corruption of the system, were then thrown together and moulded into one giant organism. A seething tornado of fury. That's why it attacks the lush green planet it created. It wants to make it uninhabitable for the Gelfs, 
So they can't use it to traverse the Omnizone. Lister nodded. Magruder continued. Its fury is contagious. All who inhale its wind become consumed with such wrath. Husband kills wife, brother kills brother, parent kills child. Lister remembered the snarling bodies twisted in combat in the carcass of the volunteer ship, and this makes the planet totally uninhabitable. The dingo tank, sir, put me on the first volunteer ship. Two thousand of us. Now there are scarcely forty left. How come you guys made it? We discovered a way of surviving the wind. All those who hate come together in a circle of Saka Fakeri, and one must be sacrificed. The full fury of the rage enters one of the group, and he is immolated, but the others live. A gelf stood in the entrance to the cave. Nawaki, sire! It is time. You must delay no more. Magruder nodded. Come, Mr. Lister. You will travel with me. You can tell me more stories of my father's remarkable deeds. Yeah, said Lister, uncertainly. Uh, sure thing. Lister, Retrocreben, Magruder and the party of Gelfs headed south towards a fan of mountains, while the other two groups headed west and east. The rage swept in from the north. The direction each party had taken had been decided by drawing straws, and it became clear to Lister, two hours later, as his group navigated its way along a mountain pathway thick with sludge, that it was their group that was going to be hit. He stared into the valley below and watched as the electric orange twister scythed its way across the countryside, devouring the land like a greedy bird eating a line of grain. Three times the party changed tack, and three times the rage changed with them. It was moving at a speed close to four hundred miles an hour, roaring a demonic seal bark. There was no place to hide on the mountain pathway, no place of protection. Magruder signalled for them to make their preparations. The party divided into three groups, each bound together by a rope that was secured to the rock face with climbing hooks. Then they waited. Less than five minutes later, it was upon them. Lister hung on to his climbing rope as the rage scoured the mountainside. He watched helplessly as the power of the Gestalt hauled the hooks out of the rock face and tossed one of the other two parties off the mountain. Then the rage entered him. Its warm, nauseating breath reached inside him and started to explore his being. A tidal wave of anger thrashed through him, pure, mindless, undiluted fury. It made him feel powerful. He'd been wronged, terribly wronged, wronged by someone or something he couldn't quite recall. It felt good, so good. This anger, this fury was a great gift. Suddenly, he had something he could believe in, something he would gladly have died to defend. Because this anger was the fury of the righteous, the fury of the innocent, and they must have their revenge. Then the rage passed over them, and the funnel-shaped winds spiralled off into the distance, leaving the denuded rock face behind. Lister watched it go. All that remained was his hatred, his hatred of some formless adversary. Why had Magruder led them here? Why had he trusted him? He wanted to kill him. Magruder untied himself from the climbing hooks, his lips drought thin and humorless, his eyes black and dead. Lister picked up a climbing hook and launched himself at him. The marine slammed him to the ground and stamped his foot down hard on Lister's throat. We have to form the circle of Saka Fakeri to banish the rage. One of us will die, sir. The eight survivors sat in the circle of Saka Fakeri and joined hands. Seconds passed before slowly, quietly, but growing in volume. A sound like ten thousand dying locusts started to vibrate into existence. And then a howling red wind patterned with the faces of demons 
rotated around the group, entering each of them by mouth or ear and exiting by the same. Round and round it went, faster and faster. Each time the rage passed through Lister, his whole body became energised, even though it possessed him for scarcely a nanosecond. Every nerve ending in his being pleaded for more, more of the fury, more of the power, more of the undiluted, pure, white rage that lifted him beyond himself and made him a god. Round and round it went. All he wanted was for it to possess him, so for that one brief second of time he would have all the fury, all deliriously, blissfully to himself. That it would take his life as a consequence was a price he would have paid tenfold. He screamed out and begged it to destroy him. He implored it to possess him, and soon they were all shouting, all pleading, all screaming, and the red wind bansheed through them before gradually, almost unnoticeably, it began to slow down. Round it went, through Retrocreben, through Magruder, through the Gelfs, through Lister, slower and slower. It was stopping. Through Retrocreben, through Magruder, through the Gelfs, then it stopped, teetering between Lister and the last Gelf. Both were screaming for it to possess them, both crying helplessly for it to make them gods, for just a tiny fraction of a fraction of a fraction of time. Back and forth it rocked between them, before it paused over Lister, and then returned to the Gelf. The Gelf's body was consumed with the full impact of the rage. He screamed out in ecstasy before his flesh aged in an instant and fell off his bones in a curtain of dust. It was over, for now, at least. Kachansky opened her eyes and stared at the man standing at the end of her bunk. Somehow this man had stolen Crichton's voice and was imparting an urgent message to her using precisely the mechanoid's tones. Was she dreaming? Gradually, her ears tuned in to what the figure was saying. And now, I'm human. What? said Kachansky. You did what? Crichton beamed. I haven't felt this good since I accidentally welded my groinal socket to a front-loading washing machine. I just wanted you to be the first to know. A blush pinked his new human face. Chris... He chuckled like a naughty schoolboy. See you in the morning. She let him get halfway down the staircase before she called him back. Crichton! Yes, Chris? Now you're human, I want to give you a bit of advice. Yes? Wear clothes. Crichton looked down at his naked body. You humans, how on earth do you do it? He cradled his temples with the flats of his hands. There's just so much to remember. At first light, the cat slunk into Starbug's midsection and sat next to Rimmer, who was logging their current supply inventory. Next to him, eating breakfast, was a man the cat had never seen before. Ah, fellow humanoid, greetings. The man pointed to his breakfast plate. My very first meal, boiled chicken ovulations. Delicious. Crichton, bud, is that you? What the hell happened, guy? I went back to the DNA modifier and made myself human. You chose that face? Now, I think it's a rather nice face. The cat studied it carefully. You sure it's not inside out? So, how's the new human? Kachansky trotted down the spiral staircase in a long T-shirt. Most excellent, Chris. Although I must confess I have a number of questions about my new physique. I made a little list if you'll indulge me. He took a piece of paper from his dressing gown pocket and scanned its contents. First, my optical system doesn't appear to have a zoom function. Human eyes don't have a zoom function, said Rimmer, peering up from his inventory. Then how do you bring a small object into sharp focus? Kachansky grimaced before she was able to reply. Well, you, uh, 
just move your head closer to the object. He eyed her as if she were a dubious second-hand car dealer who had just made some patently absurd claim. You move your head closer to the object. Yeah. He held his list out in front of him and moved his head back and forth, testing the human zoom function. What about other optical effects like a split screen, slow motion, quantel, flip, strobing? Kachansky buttered some toast. We don't have them. You don't have them. Uh, just the zoom feature. He zoomed in to his list again and tried to appear enthusiastic. Great. Well, that's uh, great. What a tricksy piece of software. He consulted his list again. Next. Oh, yes, my nipples don't work. When I was a mechanoid, twisting the right nipple nut was the way we regulated body temperature, while the left nipple was mainly used to pick up short-wave radio transmissions. What I'm saying is, no matter how hard I twiddle them, I still can't seem to pick up jazz FM. Human nipples don't do that. They're just there for... decoration. They don't perform any snazzy functions at all. Sorry. Crichton tried to remain cheerful. Recharging, he said, and picked up a brutal-looking electrical lead. I presume when humans want to recharge, they do it in much the same way as we mechanoids. Indeed, I've located what I presume to be the recharging socket, but for some strange reason, it doesn't appear to have a standard three-pin connection. Do I have to use some kind of special adapter? Because no matter what I seem to do, the lead keeps falling out. We sleep, bud. That's our way of recharging. Crichton crumpled his list and began to roll it around in his hands, as if to relieve some form of embarrassment. Now, uh, something... Well, uh, something... <coughs> he cleared his throat. Something I wanted to talk to you about. Something I, I know we humans get a little embarrassed about. Get to it, Crichton. Well, I wanted to talk to you about my penis. Kachansky couldn't help herself. A tiny tick of amusement crinkled across her face. I knew it, you've gone straight into snigger mode. Can't we discuss our reproductive systems in a mature adult fashion without degenerating into adolescent snickering? Yes, of, of course we can. Crichton pulled out a Polaroid and handed it to her. Well? Well what? What do you think? I'm not quite with you, Crichton. I mean, what am I supposed to say? I want to know, is that normal? Taking photographs of it and showing your friends. It's not, no. But it's hideous. Is that the best design they could come up with? Are you seriously telling me there were choices and someone said, There, that's it. That's the shape we're looking for. The last chicken in the shop look. Shakespeare had one of those? Einstein? Perry Como sang Memories Are Made of This with one of those stashed down his slacks? Crichton shook his head. I think I understand now why humans don't have a zoom mode. He handed her another Polaroid. Take a look at this. Crichton handed her a third Polaroid. And this. She put the two snaps together, one above the other. Her mouth dropped open so wide it could have garaged the Buick. Now, why do you suppose that happened? What were you thinking about at the time? Nothing special. I was just idly flicking through a, an electrical appliance catalogue, and suddenly my underpant elastic was catapulting across my quarters. You see, you're neither one thing nor the other. You're human on the outside, but you're still a mechanoid on the inside. You shouldn't be getting a double Polaroid about electrical equipment. But it was a triple-sack easy-glide vac with turbo suction and a self-emptying dust bag. Don't you see? It means you're not truly human. You're still a mechanoid, whether you like it or not. I think you should change back, said Rimmer, completing his inventory. What? Be become one of those poor, sappy, sad-act mechanoids again? But this is my dream. Kachansky got up from the scanner table and started putting on her diving suit. Sometimes having your dreams come true can be the worst thing that can ever happen to you. What do you mean? Becoming human isn't going to solve all your problems. You're still the same person, with the same hang-ups. Inside, nothing's changed. But I don't have any hang-ups, not now. I hope you're right. I really do. Come on. we better get back to the Mayflower and pick up the rest of the salvage. Rimmer nodded. We want to be out of here in eight hours. 
Kachansky, Cat, Rimmer and Crichton staggered down the thin metal staircase, carrying the ten-foot-long oxygen tank like a roll of carpet. An hour remained before the mulch would be ready for penetration, and already they'd successfully completed four salvage missions. As they rounded a tight bend in the stairwell, the cat suddenly felt his grip on the smooth black cylinder begin to loosen. The tank slithered from the cat's grip, and the momentum took it clean through Rimmer and Kachansky's arms. Crichton found himself falling backwards down the staircase, pursued by a 400-pound lead tank packed with compressed air. Once, twice, three times the back of his head smacked against the metal railings as he somersaulted boot over shoulders down the staircase. The oxygen tank tobogganed down the final flight of steps and hit him straight in the solar plexus at a speed of just under four miles an hour. He howled plaintively. Then, still groaning, he rolled to his right and caught his testicles on the nozzle end of the tank. His introduction to physical pain was complete. Groggily, he sat up and gazed down at his leg, happily pumping blood from an ugly grin in his thigh. He glowered at the cat. Look what you've done to my new body. I've not even had it one day and it's a write-off. Sorry, bud. I just, uh, lost my grip. My whole left leg is completely ruined. It'll need stitches. Kachansky stepped in. Cry, calm down. You'll be okay. You're suffering from new car owner syndrome. Crichton scrambled off the packing case and swung a right uppercut which took the cat unawares and planted him on his back in the middle of some freeze-dried food supplies. Kachansky and Rimmer stood bewildered, watching as the cat somersaulted upright and rained a series of lightning blows to Crichton's face and stomach. Crichton staggered around, doubled in two from the cat's savaging. Now look what you've done. You've made me go purple. You started it. First time on the clay wheel head. You crinkled my suit. Kachansky bear hugged Crichton from behind and dragged him to one side. Then she took out a handkerchief and handed it to Crichton to mop the blood from his mouth while she dressed his leg with bandages ripped from her blouse. You don't think I should stay human, do you? You think I can't cope? Kachansky shrugged. Only you know that. I'm a mechanoid. I don't want to be human. A grin illuminated his face, and for the first time since he'd become human, he looked happy. Starbug broke the ocean surface in an explosion of foam. Rimmer sat in front of the mainframe and closed down the comm channel. That was the head of records in Siberia. Seems Listy was sentenced to 18 years hard thought for leading the break-in. And, said Crichton, and he's no longer there. He escaped three weeks ago with some kind of morph. No one's got the faintest clue where he is now. Finding him is going to be next to impossible. Kachansky looped the vial of look virus off her neck and held it up to the light. A quarter remained. We've got to be able to use this somehow, she pointed at the tube. The answer's in there somewhere. They stared at it, thinking... Crichton began. What is luck? When a person is lucky, they have the ability to influence and manipulate the physical environment. They're able to make a roulette wheel stop on a certain number, persuade others to do their bidding, browbeat fate into giving them what they most desire. How? There's only one explanation. If luck is some kind of positive infection, then it must somehow enhance the individual's sixth sense imbue them with new powers. After all, stopping a roulette wheel is a form of telekinesis. Kachansky nodded. If that's true, there are no boundaries to what this stuff can do. The only limitation will be our own imaginations. OK, how about this, said Rimmer. It breaks every known law of the universe, and some that are unknown too. Go on, said Kachansky, intrigued. We each take a sip of the luck virus and write down the coordinates of where we believe Lister is. If that stuff really works, then by pure luck, we should each write down the same correct set of coordinates. Then we set a course. 
Crichton beamed. The vial was passed around the table, and one by one they imbibed its contents. Kachansky took the almost empty tube and hung it back around her neck. Poles. North is positive, south is negative. We should each have six figures with degrees and minutes. Good luck. They each wrote down a set of coordinates, folded the paper, and placed it in a pile in the middle of the scanner table. Rimmer opened the first. Twenty-five degrees, forty-six minutes. Eight degrees, twelve minutes. Three degrees, fifty-four minutes. He opened the second piece of paper. Twenty-five, forty-six, eight, twelve, three, fifty-four. The third. Twenty-five, forty-six, eight, twelve, three, fifty-four. Finally, he opened the last. Sixty-two, eighteen, twenty-one, thirty-seven. Whose is this? Mine. Crichton replied, "I was using Johnson's elliptical system. I didn't realize you'd be using the old galactic guide. Allow me to transpose the figures: twenty-five, forty-six, eight, twelve, three, fifty-four." Crichton waddled up to the navy comp. Rimmer followed him. Where is it? Crichton logged in. According to the star charts, it's a planet that's dangerously close to the event horizon of the aureole of black holes that rings the Omni Zone. In fact, it should get sucked past the event horizon any day now. The event horizon's the point of no return. What's our ETA? Crichton loaded the information into the computer. At present speed, we'll be there in thirty-two weeks. That's way too late. The cat picked up a pen. And started to scribble furiously. Wait a minute, I'm getting an idea. Okay, here it is. I'm just going to take a shot at guessing a new system of transport. I'm going to call it a hyperdrive, and it works like this: first you punch a hole in space, then you bend time and leap into the tenth dimension, harnessing something I'm going to call super string. Here's the first bit of it. What do you think? Rimmer squinted down over his shoulder. Does this make sense? Can we use it? The first part, of the, the theoretical equation for hyperspace, is absolutely correct, sir. However, the computations after that will be a stroll into the unknown with a white cane. I suggest we log it into the computer and see what happens. The small emerald planet teetered on the brink of the event horizon. Lister, Retrocreben, Magruder. And the rest of the survivors huddled around a sad-looking fire, sipping the last of the soup, and staring down the massive canyon that looked as if it had been gouged out of desert rock by a gigantic ice cream scoop. In the distance, the rage patrolled the entrance to the underground caverns, half a day's walk away. The rage had won. It had successfully defended its planet from all comers. No one could survive here. No one could live on its surface, and now, vindictive to the end, it shielded the caverns from the survivors, ensuring their destruction when the planet passed through the ring of black holes. Lister swirled a piece of bread around in his soup. They had to kill the rage; it was their only hope. But how? It was an entity composed of pure emotion, a force, an energy, something without conventional form or content, something without a heart or brain, something that was just a mass of seething resentment, out of control, and determined to defend the planet from life, any life. A noise of landing retros cut across him, and the clay ceiling of the cave started to crumble. It was almost. As if a spacecraft was trying to land on top of them, Lister rushed outside onto the precipice overlooking the canyon and looked up at the roof. Tilting at a ridiculous angle, was a small green craft lodged precariously in the foliage of the mountainside. The hatch door hinged open, and a girl with lagoon blue eyes and a pinball smile strode down the landing ramp. A smile soared Lister's face in half. Hey, hey! She threw herself off the cave roof and landed on top of him. They hit the ground hard and rolled over and over in the dirt. They kissed, 
small and big. They devoured one another. They hugged, they laughed, they cried, they, they hugged some more. Then they just looked at one another, holding hands and grinning like puppies. After that, to the distress of everyone watching, they started all over again from the top. Many minutes later, far more than it's interesting to recount, they emerged, grinning and breathless. The Starbug crew stood in a horseshoe alongside Retro Creven, Magruder and the assortment of Gelfs. Lister grabbed its hand. Come on, you gotta meet the posse. This is Retro Creven. This is Mike Magruder. Magruder smiled amiably and shook Kachansky's hand. Then Lister remembered. Where is he? He gazed around, looking for Rimmer. Man, come here. There's, there's someone you've got to meet. He beckoned him forward. Rimmer, er, uh, I mean, er, uh, oh, er, uh, sir, over here. Rimmer stepped through the pack. Lister brought the two men together. I want you to meet Lieutenant Colonel Michael R. Magruder. Pleased to meet you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Rimmer smiled courteously. And Mike, said Lister, pulling Magruder closer. This is Arnold J. Rimmer. Magruder blinked twice, smiled sweetly. Then six foot, two inches of solid marine hit the dirt in a dead faint. Rimmer smirked down at the Polak's figure. Supposed to be a marine, and he's fainted like a bloody girl guide. Who did you say he was? His name is Michael Magruder. He's your son. Pardon me? I said, he's your son. My son? Yes. My son? Yes. My son? Yes! Rimmer cleared his throat and kicked some dirt about with his right foot. Then looked up again. Who is he? He's your son, Rimmer. Rimmer looked at Lister. His head angled in bemusement. My son? Yes! That man there, the one who just fainted, the one who's your son, yes, that one, he's your son. Wait, it's, it's terribly important that I get this clear in my head. Let me tell you what I think you're saying. Rimmer tried to cough away a dry throat. <clears throat> you're saying that this man, this man here, who is my son, is in fact my son. There was a cloud of dust, and Rimmer joined Magruder, belly up in the dirt. Rimmer was lobotomized with shock. Yvonne Magruder had decided to have his child. If it hadn't been for the radiation leak and Red Dwarf having to be jettisoned off into the wastes of space, perhaps she might have tried to contact him. Maybe they would even have got together again. Yvonne Magruder. She was really together and attractive and... She'd had his son. Lister's voice dragged him away from his musings. Look, man, uh, <clears throat> listen to me. This is, a uh, This bit's important. What bit? Uh, Yvonne Magruder. Uh, she's been bottle-feeding him warm bulls since the day he was born. What do you mean? She's done a fantastic job. He's a Space Corps Marine. An SCM. There isn't a finer soldier. No, I mean about you. She's sort of given him the impression that you're some... some sort of hero. He's kind of modelled his life on this father figure who's a, a mix of Patton, Nelson and Ulysses all rolled into one. I've played along with it, but now you're here. Well, you'll know in two seconds you've got less backbone than custard. I think you've got to come clean with him before he... before he works it out for himself. Damn it! Kachansky hit the console as the starter motor failed to ignite the engines. Lister shook his head. It's something to do with the rage. It's able to detect and neuter large electrical power sources. What about Crichton and Rimmer? They're both part electrical. I suppose their power sources are too small to detect, Lister continued. If it's anything like last time, the rage will make a move any moment. It'll want to total the ship before we're able to salvage too many supplies. Crichton gazed across the plane. 
I believe it started to make its move already, sir. At present speed, it should be here within the hour. Lister turned. Guys, get the others and start up the mountain with the heavy stuff. We'll catch you up, okay? The cat and Retrocreben nodded and disappeared down the landing ramp, carrying a large wooden food crate. Lister and Kachansky started ransacking the galley, while Crichton made a start on the obs deck. No one had worked it out yet, and Crichton was thankful. It gave him more time to make his preparations undisturbed. He climbed the steps up to the obs deck and got started. With luck, he'd be far away and unstoppable before anyone even knew what he was up to. The time had come.